In 2015, Nigerians voted for an opposition candidate against an incumbent for the first time in her 55-year history. General Muhammadu Bahari took the oath of office as Nigeria's sixth elected president. I, Muhammad Buhari, do solemnly swear that I will be faithful and there are two adherents to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and that I will preserve, protect and defend the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So help me God. I tried three times. 2003, 2007, 2011, and I ended up in Supreme Court three times. It was evident that a lot had gone wrong from the beginning. Oil price fell to $34, dollars a barrel. The um, militants in the Niger Delta were blowing up. Uh, pipelines and other oil assets. So production actually fell to something like 700,000 at some point in below 700,000 barrels. So it was a very bumpy, I must, I must say, to put it as mildly as possible, a very bumpy start. Uh, when this president took over, he met an industry that is uh, staggering to, to operate. Decision makers were difficult, decision make, decisions are made on the basis of uh, personal considerations. And the meaning of this is that you now have assets in the hands of people who cannot properly run those assets. And the ultimate reason is that we are at a principle of collapse. The country was in a disorderly state. The greatest challenge then was insurgency. And that insurgency was we were running the country. The insurgency started in northeast. It moved into northwest. It moved into north central. It moved into the federal capital, Abuja. It had gone as far as Kogi, or as near as Kogi, to the southwest. After Kogi, where would we go? Southwest. If it overruns southwest, we are in south south. And what is left of the country? You weren't sure that Nigeria would be there in the next couple of weeks. Now, these were just the domestic issues we met on the ground, but there were other associated threats coming from outside Nigeria. The most immediate was the emerging threat in our uh, immediate eastern neighbor, Cameroon, with the secessionist agitation by the Amazonians in the Anglophone part of Cameroon. And they were already shifting into Nigerian territory. They had already infiltrated about 11 states of Nigeria. And there was also a threat coming in as a fallout of the situation in Iraq and Syria. When the terrorists and the insurgents were flushed out of those two countries, these criminal elements in turn started moving southwards into the Sahel and their ultimate destination was Nigeria by virtue of the fact that Nigeria had a very large population and it had the largest economy. The image of Nigeria was uh, at a very, very low ebb. There was the unfortunate event of the Chibok girls that had um, really captured the imagination of the world. The oil crisis was just beginning. There was a scandal um, about um, 20 billion uh, US dollars that um, was uh, missing. Nigerians were not happy with the government in 2014 and the run on to the 2015 general elections. They felt that the economy was badly handled. They felt security was a major concern. They felt that the government was not doing a good job with tackling corruption. Even the government that was leaving had predicted that the economy was heading into a recession. In 2016, we went into a recession. This recession lasted uh, three quarters. In the fourth quarter, we exited. Uh, the economy was very much dependent on import of food items, especially rice. Rice was costing 
the country a lot in terms of imports. The aim is to make sure that we grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Nigeria before they depend on the importation of rice from Taiwan and other places. But Nigerians are now exporting rice. And there are people who left air conditioned offices, went back to the land, and they haven't reverted it. The campaign we conducted in asking Nigerians to be self-reliant. We have the land, we have the resources, we have the people. Then why should we depend on anybody to feed us or to do any favor to us? This is one of 10 rice mills across the country that the government is constructing. This is all to increase agricultural productivity uh, in the country, especially rice. These warehouses can contain about uh, 6,000 tons of grain. 6,000 tons? Yes. Okay. Yes. That is white maize. Very good. Yeah, uh, that's good. Nice grains. Yeah. It's, uh, the season uh, ended in uh, December yeah. 2021. 20, okay. All right. Okay. Very good. This particular administration has been so much to the point that Nigeria is the number one producer of rice in Africa. When we went to China, uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, in talking about the prerequisites for the industrialization, mm -hmm. or like the Chinese miracle, he said that you need to be able to feed yourself. So this president is right. Feed ourselves first, and then move on to other things. Today, the world is suffering from a major food crisis. The fallout in the Russian-Ukraine war has been felt more in the kitchens and around the dinner tables globally. President Buhari's drive to make agriculture a driving force in Nigeria's economy has spared Nigeria, a country of over 200 million people. Nigeria is not only able to feed its population, it is also exporting food to other countries. If you depend on somebody for uh, two or three years a day, then you are in trouble. The same thing to initiate any nation that depends on anybody to provide either food or security or that nation, then that nation has compromised its uh, independence and its integrity. Nigeria is self-sufficient in food that we don't have to import food to be able to feed our people. So for anybody that is importing food, they're doing it as a matter of luxury, not as a matter of necessity. No government, no administration in the recent past that has put more money in particular in the hands of smallholder farmers. No one has diversified the economy using agriculture than this particular administration. Young people are coming into farming more than in the previous administrations. With the recession behind it, it was time to build on the gains of his first term as the president's second term began. Then, an enemy the world never saw coming crippled the globe. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The World Health Organization has now confirmed what many epidemiologists have been saying for weeks. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Early in January, we heard about this cluster of cases uh, of a new illness in, in China. Uh, I was part of a, a group of global experts. We were brought together by the World Health Organization to go to China, and by that time, you know, the, the outbreak was already uh, a mature outbreak in China. And they had shut down the entire country, especially the Wuhan uh, province. But to me, the first thing that struck me when I got to China was um, um, what it means to lock down a country as big as that. The difficulty is that if you do not try and suppress this, uh, virus, it can overwhelm your health system. Well, there are two thoughts. First of all, was the speed and uh, the ease with, with which this uh, virus was spreading around the world, which was terrifying. And uh, the second was uh, the, let us say, the strengths and weaknesses of our own health system. 
How do we cope with this uh, challenge? The presidential task force was set up, led by the secretary to the government of the federation, and my brother and colleague Sami Ali was coordinating. And we put heads together, and we quickly realized that this is not something we could just rely on our, our traditional voices and means of communication, and we really had to bring in everyone. Everybody thought that, okay, this is another scam, a little scam to steal money. Uh, this is their disease. I was met with these kind of challenges, but with persistence and determination, we were able to begin some communication with the Nigerian people, and they began to adopt and even respect and oblige the non-pharmaceutical measures that we put in place. We started to increase the capacity to diagnose in more laboratories, more reagents, and uh, at that time planning to uh, set up uh, more isolation centers. We were in this place where uh, all the beds are automated with triple mattresses and so on, and uh, the ventilators and the uh, monitors are all connected, and uh, there are various other equipment like uh, echo so that the patient does not go to uh, the main hospital and can do all the facility have the guys echo ECG you know dedicated to this place. Many innovations were done to deliver content to students at home through television, through internet sometimes. So the federal government has done that even though it is not in its line of duty. Uh, the expectation of the world was that they were going to be picking dead bodies on the continent of Africa, on the streets. Uh, but we proved them wrong. Uh, I believe it's our resolve and our determination as a country and as a continent to fight uh, for our lives. You know, uh, particularly in Nigeria, you know, we love life. Nobody wants to die. That part of the period also helped us to make comprehensive assessment of the healthcare system in the country. And with that assessment, we were able to now refocus funding that was supposed to have served other sectors to see health infrastructure in the country. So you have in every state at least one federal medical center or one tertiary hospital that has been fully upgraded because of the COVID-19. This is a, a model, a newly designed model of a primary healthcare center, the foundation of the healthcare system in Nigeria. We are going to have one of these type in every political ward of the country. That will be nearly 10,000 units. And supposed to attend to the needs, health needs, up to 70% of the population with the basic minimum package of health care. While most of the world was hobbled by COVID, Nigeria embraced technology and overcame the pandemic. Government businesses used technology to forge ahead. So did the economy and life. But infrastructure was another big hurdle. For decades, Nigerian roads, rail, and other infrastructure had been left to decay. We talk of Europe and America, and the important thing is developing infrastructure. We develop infrastructure, so so roads, rain, power, and security. Without this, no nation can move uh, forward. If you don't have infrastructure, you are just wasting your time, no matter what resources you think you have. The first meeting I had with President Buhari a week after my inauguration as Minister for Power Works and Housing, and he said to me, Look, I want to know what is delaying the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. I want to know why the second Niger has not been constructed. I want to know why it is taking one week to traverse between Ilori and Jeba, which is only 100 kilometers. And I want to rebuild the Abuja Kano Highway. Mm -hmm.
We see people that have been completed on both sides. The focus of our infrastructure development has been on connecting economic zones. The thought behind it is how do we ensure that we connect the economic groups effectively? And then we do other things because obviously states also have their own responsibility with respect to infrastructure. Many of the major roads that connect major cities in Nigeria were built in the 70s, probably the 80s. The last of them was the Abuja to Kano Road, which was reconstructed and dualized between 1986 when it was awarded and completed in 1991. That's over 25 years, almost 30 years to the day now. And the population hasn't stopped growing, businesses haven't stopped expanding. The ports were built in the 70s, the airports, the seaports. So that was the infrastructure that the Buhari administration inherited. It was an infrastructure that was already beginning to make life difficult for Nigerians. <laughs> Which is starting with BGN now is the reason why we are discussing uh, a new deep seaport in Bonin. There is also the Badagin seaport, which is around a private investment, and the Ibaka deep seaport, which is being considered by the, the, the government of Akwaibon, which is a foreign international, with an international company. This is the first time we're having a seaport in Nigeria. What we've had is a, we've had river ports, where the three of the sea. If you look at Tinkan and Papa, the tea of the sea. Put out on there and put out on seaport. Tea of the sea. The same with Salabra. The same with water. They are river. They are the river. But the river enters into the sea. That's why you bought the tea, the tea of the sea. So they are all river ports. The first seaport in Nigeria will be the one at Lekki. That's why it starts as Lekki Deep Seaport, which is 16 and 17 meters draft. These are 11, 12, maximum 13 meters draft. And there are very few vessels at uh, that level. But I got the same. This is one government that has, in that one, the most ambitious investment in our uh, infrastructure. We've commissioned all the airports that we inherited and committed Kano, Abuja, Lagos, and Port Harcourt. Within the same time, we reconstructed the Abuja runway. Contracts for the second runway has been awarded. One project President Buhari has championed with unrelenting vigor is the reconstruction of the second Niger Bridge. A 1.6 kilometer bridge with an additional 10.3 kilometer highway on both sides of Asaba and Onisha. The bridge that connects the southeast of Nigeria to the rest of the country. The second Niger Bridge has become perhaps more topical simply because it just used to be a campaign promise after which nothing happened. So this is the first government that not only made it a campaign promise, but made it a governmental commitment and it is nearing completion now. What I I am proud to report is that journey times have significantly reduced. So roads Journeys that used to take four days now take three hours. At the time we took office, construction companies were laying off workers. Uh, the story is different today. They're employing more people. Uh, construction related activities are driving uh, the national economy. A lot of people used to live in Abuja and have a family in Kaduna. Now live in Kaduna. They don't have to pay for two houses as rent. They don't have to pay double rent. 
you don't have to buy the refrigerators, you don't have to pay um, power, um, CPU here yeah, and pay CPU for that. Because what will happen to them is 6 a.m. you wake up, you feed the train, you feed the chair before 8, you go to work. You pay for work, you feed the train, you go back to Kaduna. So all that double cost that you used to be will have flashed back to run. By the courage of Mr. President and his ability to see the big picture coming forward and a great future for this country and this company that the PI is coming to be. The PI will get back to our new company, the NPC Limited, which will still be a matter of history for this country and this country will always remember Mr. President. Thank you very much. Now you have a company that is a limited liability company governed by a new set of laws called the Petroleum Industry Act. And the meaning of this is that this company must declare dividend to its shareholders. It must act like just any other private company. It will also compete with its peers in the industry, in the entire energy sector. What it does is that to deliver more dividend, more efficiently, more positively to its shareholders. And of course, these shareholders are the 200 million Nigerians. The whole idea is for us to really overhaul and give the oil industry a complete makeover and open up new opportunities in the oil industry. We believe that the easiest way to diversify Nigeria's economy is still within the oil and gas sector. Now as a private limited company, all of it owned by the government, it will be able to raise money in the international markets and be able to get into a sort of joint ventures and sort of that it was not able to do, attract the kind of capital we should. And most importantly, and inherit the sort of corporate governance which encourages global investment flows to come into a limited liability company right now as a um, viable platform for harnessing oil and gas resources. Why is it Nigeria? There is no power. There is power. Uh, but the best uh, question you should ask, why is it that power is not enough in Nigeria? If you compare us with other countries, we may be even better than them. But uh, our size may also uh, give us away. Because uh, for a country with 200 million population and a GDP of close to 500 billion dollars, with only the electricity hovering around 5,000 megawatts, you may say we are not doing too well. We set a roadmap for the country to deliver first uh, increased electricity output. The medium term strategy was uh, stable electricity and the long term uh, plan was uninterrupted tech power. And I think that we have made a lot of progress in terms of increasing the supply of electricity because people used to feed back to us then that their electricity supply was predictable. If it was not yet uninterrupted, we could plan. They knew when the outages were likely to happen, which was different from the past. And that their consumption of diesel and petrol to provide alternative electricity generating facilities for themselves have significantly reduced because our supply was getting better. One of the president's key goals was to stabilize power in Nigeria. At the onset of the COVID pandemic in 2020, his chief of staff, Malam Abakiari, set off for Germany to meet with Simmons about bringing Nigeria out of darkness. Malam Kiari contracted COVID and passed away. But his supreme national sacrifice means Nigeria can start dreaming 
a better power supply again. This one is also coming in in three phases. The first phase is to be able to uh, uh, raise the operational capacity of the national grid uh, and the uh, distribution to 7,000 megawatts quickly. And this is the phase we are now working on. The system collapse that we used to experience close to like 20 times in a year that is showing how unstable and how weak the national grid was but throughout 2021 we had only two partial system collapse on uh, on the uh, uh, grid that is showing that the grid is getting stronger Recently, we experienced three system collapse in 2022. 20, uh, this was not due to the weakness or whatever of the grid. It is due to the fact that there was a vandalized pipeline that takes gas to one of our plants. And suddenly, the plant has to shut down. And that causes the instability around the whole grid. Some vandals went and cut off the, 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 the tower of a 330 line. And that also sent the, the, the shock around the grid. And the grid collapses around evening time that day. One can argue that without vandalism, Nigeria would be further along in her development. It's been a case of the government pulling the country two steps forward and vandals dragging us five steps back. Vandals disrupt most sectors of the economy, from transport to aviation, but especially in oil and power. I you know, occasion to speak to leadership of people from the South South. You know, this interference with the uh, infrastructure. And I told them that uh, if you go and blow a fly, or you sabotage the oil head, you pollute the environment. I said the area you people are that are claiming this petroleum uh, product, the fish goes back into the sea. The rest of the area is polluted. You cannot farm. You cannot fish. And the majority of your people that I was telling them are farmers and fishermen. So you are finishing your own people more than the rest of Nigeria. I hope they have seen the sense in that. Until we inculcate the attitude of change in Nigerians and begin to resuscitate our value system and begin to get Nigerians to believe that, they must embark on immediate attitudinal change, putting country first and begin on a massive re reorientation campaign and engagement of the citizenry. We will not achieve the full change, but that change is achievable when you and I believe that this Nigeria and this space, whatever we call it, is ours to own and we collectively own it. When the Buhari administration came to power, education was near rock bottom. Key subjects like history were off the curriculum. The number of children out of school were in the millions. Something had to be done. As a nation, when we have our difference, it's a necessary thing. But the education is our way out. When we educate people, there is a level below which they will not operate, they will not accept. But if you leave them uneducated, then you make them susceptible to all sorts of cynic and religious anti-national positions and that's we are what we are fighting when i became minister nigeria was leading the country in the number of out of school children i made that my first target and then basic education and other literacy tertiary education and then the issues of curricula because of the advances in technology and in education we thought we should review our curriculum and we did that and then 
spread in ICT at all levels of education. And that is what is happening today. I think largely it has succeeded. Because last week I read a report by UNICEF which says that it has succeeded in attracting students to school, retaining them, and then the learning outcomes are much better than before the program. From the time we came into government to date, government has spent 2.5 trillion through that fund. That fund intervention in all schools, the public schools only, federal schools, federal universities, and then state universities. About 105 of them. There was a promise made to them in 2009 by the previous government that it will give them a total of 1.3 trillion for the revitalization of universities. We believe that government signed it in order to get rid of the crisis, not because it intended to give them, because the money was just not there. We decided to be very frank with them, to tell them that this money is not available for giving. I do believe this government is going to solve this problem. Before the coming of President Bahari, the poor were left on their own. The youth had little hope, and the old and infirm had no champion. Looking at the levels of poverty, looking at the levels of unemployment, it was evident that we needed to do something that would, to a certain extent, ameliorate the, the levels of poverty, unemployment, etc. We started with 200,000. By 2018, we had a bad B of 300,000, making it 500,000. Out of these 500,000, about 109,000 of them have become uh, entrepreneurs. They are now employers of labor and they are doing very well. My name is Indibisi from my unis. After my NYC in Kenya State, I came back to Abuja where I reside. I heard about uh, Empower when the federal government established it and I applied and I got the job. Every month we are being given some stipend of 30,000 naira. I'm Empower string A because they have about three badges now and badge A. I was able to establish myself. I had a, I have a registered company. This is our, uh, our farm. We also have one in Kubwa. For the sake of the head like this, the head, part of the body, is the executive. Who are the executives? I know you are special. Who are the executives? The president, fantastic. Come on, you said, my friend. I'm a former empire in town. I currently run labeling adult education based in Jabi Abuja. Before I joined Empower, I've been working in a private primary school, a secondary school, and of course, all of us understand that when you get when you work in the public schools, you get underpaid. That Empower has actually helped me to get these things done uh, on my own to push my vision outside. We are now using that as far as I'm going to do that. I've been here, I've been here, I've been here, I've Kumamina <laughs> The social investment program of the Bahari administration is one of the largest in the whole world. It's the first time a Nigerian government has actually reached out to the downtrodden. The main focus is on the ordinary citizens of this country. People who are below the uh, economic pyramid. People who are being affected by one uh, form of disaster or the other. We feed children every day. Primary school children, primary one to three. We are feeding about nine points. Eight million children now, and that also runs billions of naira on a monthly basis. 
the conditional cash transfer that we support poor and vulnerable households with 5,000 naira every month. We are supporting 1.9 million households with this uh, 5,000 naira. That also runs into billions of naira on a monthly basis. My mother thank you. For the triangle with uh, the tax from Gwari. My mother has used uh, the usual gym before, but the one just for Has Gwari come help, uh, help this game? Because of that, then my mother come have money to go and buy this new LG. There's a man in the president called me after about a year and a half of the program. He said, you know, that he was listening to the, I believe it was a BBC service. And he said he was struck by the fact that there were two young men from Bauchi State, I recall he said they were from Bauchi State, who were interviewed by the BBC. And they said, we heard that there was empire who applied. We didn't know anybody, we didn't know any senator, we didn't know anybody who applied. And we were given a chance to be on it. We were employed and we've been paid month by month. We're teaching in a primary school and we must thank Baba Buhari for this. And he said to me, he said, you know, this is really, that it must be very, very impactful. The Buhari administration has created economic programs at all levels of the society that lift Nigerians from dependency to economic independence. Nigeria is endowed with a lot of uh, stones around the whole country. So this is granite. We have others from Ondo, one of the rarest stones in the world. Uh, the white marble. This producer has orders from Ghana as well as Dubai. The possibilities that are there in Nigeria for everything that is around us. This goes to Milan. For this piece, you probably will get twelve dollars for it. Okay, and this can make two, three pairs of shoes that sell for seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. You saw we said to some of our exporters, start making other things like shoes. Okay, you're not going to sell them for seven hundred dollars a pair, but you can at least get fifty dollars from it. Uh, so that produce add value and export. Uh, that principle is to try and keep moving up the global value chain to get better value for the same quantity. <laughs> This administration brought digital economy to Nigeria. There was nothing like that. What this administration did, in which the private sector has confirmed that, firstly, changing the perception of the entire sector from just ICT sector alone to digital economy. For the first time in the history of the country, the administration developed the national digital economy policy and strategy Broadband connectivity in particular is so important for us because we are developing a tech economy. We believe very strongly that the tech economy is our way of leapfrogging uh, so that we are able to go much faster. I'm sure you've heard of some of the companies in Nigeria that are doing great things. They are our unicorns, six, seven of them now, that are valued at over a billion dollars each. And they started in 2015 between two recessions in uh, early 2022 and we have these six seven companies that are billion dollar value companies today you hardly go to banks physically you do it online why because of the broadband penetration you partake in e-commerce you go to amazon or here junior or conga you purchase online why because of the broadband penetration without that you cannot do it one sector that has been of immense focus and attention is security. It is a war the administration is fighting vigorously on many fronts, starting with the now decimated Boko Haram insurgency. When we came, what was the situation in the Northeast? Most of the Northeast was in the hand of rebels, or Boko Haram, or whatever they call themselves. They were trained on religious and cultural ground. Boko Haram, with the Western education, is uh, ungodly. But which is nonsense. When they go and blow people uh, in the marketplace, in motor parks and so on, and say, Allah Akbar, God is great. God is justice. 
you can't kill innocent people and call his name. You either don't know what you are doing or you are deceiving people. Over 16 local governments in the United States were under the pangs of the insurgents. Also in Adamawa, about three local governments, and in Yobi State, equally about two local governments. So in total, we have well over 22 local governments in the Northeast that came under you know, near control of the Boko Haram. But of course, um, things turned around, and gradually, by the end of 2016, we saw a complete reversal. Right now, the Northeast in general um, are under government control. People uh, go about their daily lives. The farmers are getting back to their farmlands. The displaced populations are returning to their villages. In many ways, the calm is returning. I wouldn't say to normalcy, 100%. Life is livable now in Borno. So he has, he has done very well. He has provided all the resources required to the military and other agencies involved. The Borno State I've heard about in many circumstances around my life as a High Commissioner for Refugees and then as Secretary General was the Borno State of terrorism, of violence, of displacement, of despair. This is not the Borno that I found today. The Borno I found today is a Borno of hope. It's a border with future. And I was very impressed to see the policy that is being applied here, recognizing that you don't fight terrorism just by military means, you fight terrorism addressing the root causes of terrorism. But when I went around with the, the thousands and thousands of people that were there, I saw smiles, I saw enthusiasm, I saw hope. And this is where we must invest. When I came on board, I had a meeting with the mobile network operators and the regulators that the administ this administration of President Muhammad Buhari has prioritized security. Because of this, I want to ensure the economic development of the sector on one hand and rendering support to security institutions on the other. I want to plead with all of you that let us compromise our economic development for the sake of achieving security and stability. And they understood and they supported me wholeheartedly. It is because of this there was a time that we suspended the sale of our new sales for over six months. Before Seal was very abundant. You can only people used to go and buy seal, commit crime, and destroy it easily. Their identity was not known. Some people were detained in Nigeria with 500 seals then, before this enforcement. But today it becomes a national resource to the extent that if you obtain a seal, your identity is known. Despite beating back the Boko Haram terrorists. The insurgents that have held parts of the Sahel region captive for years started making incursions into Nigeria. It's frustrating, but we have achieved some results. Firstly, when we close the borders, so especially with Niger, from Lake Chad to Benin Republic, it's more than 1,500 kilometers. And with Benin itself, we came in and met an asymmetric situation in which the enemy is also embedded in our society. It's not necessarily someone who wears the uniform of any specific organization where you can identify him by his uniform. It's more often uh, not he's within society. So it wasn't a very, very simple um, endeavor for us to overcome the, the problems. We recognize it as a challenge that is surmountable. With the cooperation of all members of the public and the government, we are going to, 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 to change the narrative very soon. First and foremost, uh, President Buhari understood the fact that dealing with this type of problem
was not a purely kinetic or military uh, requirement. It had to be in conjunction with the larger Nigerian society and even going further with our immediate neighbors and then the wider international community. So he strengthened the framework of the intelligence organization so that there would be greater synergy and collaboration with the armed forces. So the operational elements were working hand in hand with the intelligence elements. I can tell you that this administration is one administration that has truly and genuinely resourced the armed forces in terms of procurement of equipment. And because equipment are not things you buy off the shelf, sometimes you place orders for them. The Air Force has been well equipped in terms of platforms. The Army, the Army have continuously continued to receive armaments, armories, and I believe that uh, that you will hand over a safer Nigeria to the incoming government. working tools in terms of vehicles, in terms of technical aids, in terms of body armor, in terms of arms and ammunition, and so forth. So this has uh, enhanced our level of operation. We have uh, also been motivated uh, by having an increase in our manpower. That is the recruitment which we've been doing for the past three years with a yearly increase of 10,000 personnel to the workforce. We have uh, some gun boats and marine patrol boats that we are procured during this administration, which is assisting us greatly. We have air support. As at the time I came in, only two police helicopters were working. As at now, we have six police, police helicopters that are providing air surveillance with one uh, aircraft. We have undertaken over 500 rescue operations, uh, patrols uh, to deter and prevent uh, crime from happening is yielding a lot of a lot of results. Before the coming of the Bahari administration, the military was at its lowest ebb. Once known as one of the biggest fighting forces in the world, successive administrations since the 1990s had starved the military of training, equipment, and funds. When the battle against the terrorists and the insurgents happened, they were largely unprepared. The Buhari administration went to bat trying to change that from day one. Mr. President has done so much. Within the time he came, by virtue of his focus and committed to changing the tide, got so many equipment on board for us to be able to train and be equipped for the task ahead of us. He provided resources for us to procure additional helicopters, both combat and heavy duty military helicopters, which is now within the inventory of the Nigerian Air Force. And as we speak, there is a single vessel that is sailing to our shores, just left South Africa on its way here as part of the induction of new vessels into the Navy. Besides that, we also took inventory of three uh, single vessels that uh, not only were they procured, one amongst the three was also constructed in the country. Besides that, there are so many other OPVs which the President provided resources for us to be able to uh, make available to improve on the security situation within the maritime domain. Mr. President, as of state and government, Secretary General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, lastly, I wish to thank the General Assembly for the honor bestowed on the government and people of Nigeria by electing our national His Excellency Tijani Muhammad Bandi to the presidency of the 74th session of this august body. This is indeed a great honor to our country. The Nigerian global brand um, is much stronger. And I think a lot of that uh, is due to the persona of uh, the president, President Muhammadu Buhari. Uh, he is widely respected uh, across the globe. And so he has become really the 
personification in many ways of the country. So the country is able to benefit from his personal brand. And his personal brand is uh, of a leader who is an anti-corruption crusader. For this reason, he was made the anti-corruption champion of the African Union and was invited by global heads of states on that basis. He's also recognized as a very strong and effective leader. And we've seen this with the number of Nigerians he has been able to put in the most important organizations in the world. One of the biggest legacies he made for democracy is free and fair election. No president before had allowed his party to lose an election. Buhari will allow things to work as they should and he will be the first to congratulate the winner from an opposition party. President Muhammad Buhari has suffered for the Nigerian politician. He ran three times against all odds before he won the fourth time. He doesn't want any other politician aspiring for the nation's highest office to go through this crucible. He is committed to leaving an important legacy for future generations. One of the respect, total respect of the voter, because in every democracy, the voter is the king. Nigerian voters, he insists, must be respected. The assurance he gives is one of leaving a legacy of free, fair, and transparent election. And so shall it be in 2023. I think if you judge by what he has done, and not so much about what he says, is that the first places he went after he was uh, elected uh, were the neighboring countries. And he has spent a lot of uh, time and efforts on uh, trying to secure um, our neighbors and also the West African uh, sub-region. To oppose unconstitutional change of government in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and, uh, and Chad, and elsewhere, he had also emphasized the need to strengthen African institutions, not just Nigeria going it alone, but strengthen African institutions in terms of commitment to uh, developing the security, the prosperity, and the welfare of the people. We have a president who, has, uh, who is not a now, now person. He looks to the future, what lies ahead for the nation, for its large population. We have lost of opportunities to put basic necessary infrastructure in place. Even when we had money and we didn't know what to do with that money. So he's in a hurry to recover that deficit in infrastructure. And he's, he's been investing all of his energy, all of his time to ensure that that lost opportunity is recovered. We have very major physical infrastructure that have been deployed, completed, and put to use. We have the rail lines. We have four airports that have been completed. These are major, major projects, and we funded them. We've been able to consistently pay salaries and pensions and fund government. What we have done is visible, so uh, you can disprove it. For those who are cynical and who seek to recognize some of our setbacks or political advantages. I don't feel sorry for us. We will respond when the time for politicking is afoot, and that time is now crystallizing. So as I've always said to them, I challenge you to come and debate us. We will then show our results card, and we will run uh, on the basis of uh, what we have done with our time and with our resources. One of the issues that is confronting Nigeria today is a trust deficit. And it's as a result of long years of neglect. What is happening? Uh, whatever, however laudable the policies are, people are suspect of the intentions of government. And it's informed by several years of neglect. 
And that's what we've been trying to rekindle afresh in the hearts of the people of this country that, yes, we've had bad experiences, but can we be given an opportunity to turn the process around so that we can rebuild those confidence elements that the people will begin to trust government, will begin to trust government policies. We are in a new security environment. Yes, I understand that there will be mutual suspicion and acrimonious relationships with some security agencies by virtue of past experiences. But we have to let what happened in the past, you know, remain in the past and forge new alliances. We have to work with community leaders to be able to protect uh, the, the larger society. So it is important for Nigerians, first of all, to understand that whatever effort we are going to make will amount to nothing without their support. This is a government that has faced more uh, greater economic and security challenges than any other in, the, in our history except during the war. You know, just in terms of security, but we will face greater security challenges than any other. So I think that um, just in terms of you know the capacity to respond and the capacity to remain standing and effective despite all of those um, uh, economic and security challenges, people will probably realize that these guys did quite well. <laughs> I mean, given the challenges that they face. And I hope also that history will be a fairer judge than um, our political opponents. What I have uncovered through my experience is that uh, the developing countries, we can't do half step and jump, if you know what I mean. We just have to go through the painful processes of development. I hope we will be able to read and understand the condition Nigeria was when I came in. I hope we will have the time to read and try to reflect because we have no other country called our own other than Nigeria.